Okay. Excellent. Well, it's just after two. Um, I'm going to tilt this down and stand back a little bit because I'm actually here in uh, uh, the Lewis Hine exhibition uh, at the Dorsey Museum and uh, very happy to welcome Amy Fredrickson, uh, the curatorial and collections assistant at the Dorsky. Am I right about that? <laughs> Did I get it wrong? You got it right. All right. <laughs> My colleague of about a year and a half here at the Dorsky. Um, who uh, did quite a bit of research and worked uh, worked her butt off on this show, and we're just so happy to have her as uh, part of the team and have the exhibition here. Uh, I'm going to keep it short because I know Amy will will uh, probably introduce herself a bit as well. Uh, thank you so much for being here. If you need to leave earlier, I think I heard Carlin say she needs to leave early. Uh, the, we, the recording of this will be available either on, you can vi visit the Facebook page, it'll live on the timeline, but it will also be up on our YouTube page probably within a week. So, uh, you know, if, if, you're, if you need to leave early, uh, no worries. I see we also have some people joining still, which is great. Uh, you can access this later. Please share it uh, with anybody you think might be interested uh, after the fact as well. Um, I think that's enough from me. Amy, listen, if you need me or want me at all to sort of navigate the space some, I'm happy to do that. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead, uh, toss it over to Amy Fredrickson. I'm gonna go ahead and also mute everybody except Amy. Again, towards the end when we have a, a time for questions for Amy, if you'd like, wave if you can't unmute yourself, I'm gonna be happy to unmute you. Please also, if you have questions throughout, put them into the chat window and then we can kind of look at them later. I'd like Amy to be able to do her presentation and then we can go back and uh, go over questions you may have had during uh, the presentation. So without further ado, welcome Amy Fredrickson. Thank you for being here, everybody. And uh, all right. Well, thank you, Zach. Hi, um, I'm Amy Fredrickson, Curatorial and Collections Assistant here at the Dorsky Museum and co-curator of the exhibition, Lewis Hine, Child Labor Investigator. These photographs came to the Dorsky Museum from a generous donation by Howard Greenberg and are now part of the Dorsky Permanent Collection. Together, these images, and with a few borrowed from Howard Greenberg's private collection, this exhibition tells the story of Lewis Hine and his journey to draw attention to the atrocities of child labor. So I'm going to share my screen. So I actually borrowed this image um, from another source because I wanted to show what it looked, how large his camera was that he lugged around with him to the different um, factories and farms. So Lewis Hine relied on the argument that other people were more likely to join the campaign against child labor if they felt that photographs accurately captured the reality of the situation. He also wanted to document the working conditions of the poor. No photographer in the United States until Lewis Hine made so many photographs of the working class over such a long period of time. Few until Hine came to view the poor and powerless as an integral part of the workings of the country and as having a central place in American society. But it was not until Hein, but it was not only Hein who understood, actually, I'm gonna go back into, um, here we go. Um, it is important to understand a bit about Hein's background. Lewis Hein was born in 1874 and raised in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, where his mother was a teacher and his father owned a restaurant. Following his father's death in 1892, Hines supported his family by working 13 hours a day at a furniture factory. It was there that he saw factory children caught up in the cycles of poverty, unable to attend school because they were working to support their impoverished families. He knew that their lives could not support, could not improve until the cycle was broken. Hein managed to save enough money to enroll at the University of Chicago where he earned a teaching degree and he later obtained a degree in sociology at Columbia University. It was while teaching at the Progressive Ethical Culture School in New York City that he learned photography and used it to connect with his students. Hein took his class to Ellis Island to photograph the thousands of immigrants who arrived each day from Europe. These were the photos that first caught the attention of a National Child Labor Committee. By now, Hein 
by approximately 1908, Hein had become part of the growing generation of progressive reformers working to better the lives of the poor and the disenfranchised. He was convinced that documentary photography could play an important role in achieving real social change. In the 20th century, newspapers rarely featured photographs, but that began to change and Hein is widely credited as establishing the field of photojournalism. I didn't include, Hein for each of the images includes a little transcription, um, basically with like an interview of the various children or just his observations. So I didn't include them in the slides because it would have taken up a lot of space. So if anyone has any questions on a particular um, photograph, I can, I can answer that after. So from 1907 until 1924, Hein was employed by the National Child Labor Committee. He traveled up to 30,000 miles per year documenting American children's dire working conditions. Hein took thousands of photographs with one aim to reform child labor laws. By publishing these images in newspapers and National Child Labor Committee campaigns and presentations. This is an example of a poster the NCLC produced to get the American people to understand how dangerous child labor was for American children. Hein knew that these often disturbing images were vital to the NCLC's call for government regulation. They are proof that the laws were being broken. Hein also knew the power of children's faces and the heartbreaking stories needed to fuel public opinion and sway the minds of lawmakers. But it was not only Hein who understood the power of the images, so did factory foremen. Following publication of his early photographs, implicated business owners cried fake pictures and banned him from entering their factories and farms. Undeterred, Hein went undercover, dressed in a three-piece suit with his bulky camera often hidden under his coat and his notebook in his pocket. Hein assumed a variety of personas to gain entrance to these facilities. He often posed as an insurance agent, an industrial photographer, or even a Bible salesman. When, when Hein was unable to enter a facility, he simply waited outside, photographing children and families during breaks and on their way home. He sometimes made follow-up visits to research family records before reporting back to the NCLC. In this photo and the following photo, Hein captures several girls as they enter a textile factory in Alabama, and the next one is from Tennessee, um, as they are heading, heading from the textile factory to their lunch, to their lunchtime. And in these situations, Hein was unable to, to enter these facilities, so he had to stay outside. This is the next one, leaving the factory for lunch. Once inside the premises, Hein happily engaged with the children asking about their living conditions and their work. He, his tailored suit came in handy. If the child did not know how old they were, he would estimate their age by measuring the height against the buttons on his vest. In this photograph, Hein has the children lined up at noon hour at the Yazoo City yarn mill. The superintendent had stated, we, we relieve all children under 16 for two hours a day, except the Dolphers who get plenty of time off. They go out and play. Then turning to the children, he said, now play. The children stared at him blankly. Play what? Oh, play anything. To Hein, it was clear these children were not offered many breaks. Hein's time working in the furniture factory as a teenager exposed him to the exploitation of child workers. And perhaps it was a mix of empathy and anger that inspired his commitment to labor reform. He knew that factory and mill owners favored child laborers in part because their small size allowed them to move in confined areas where adults could not fit. Most children work barefoot because it was easier for them to climb on the machinery to reach the bobbins or threads. As a result, the accident rate was much higher for children than adults. Because windows needed to be closed to prevent the threads from breaking, mills were hot and steamy, and young children often develop respiratory diseases such as bronchitis and tuberculosis. In this image, we see Pinky Durham and his sister Eliza. And Eliza is 11 and um, Pinky is eight. And neither of them are, are able to attend school. And Eliza had recently broken her leg from climbing on top of um, one of the textile machines. And they, she was, she'd been working for a year before her accident. And then this little boy, 
um, John Point Dexter helped his mom rather than attending school. He's 10 years old and he says that he helps his mom in the spooling room every day. And then this six-year-old girl goes to school sometimes but needs help, needs to help her mother because her mother's vision has um, deteriorated and she can no longer work. So now six-year-old Willie Cherry has to help her mom earn enough money to pay their rent. Pine also visited farms across the country taking pictures of children tending crops such as beet, beets and tobacco. These tasks were often dangerous. Crop stems often towered over children as young as five as they crawled for hours on their hands and knees thinning out seedlings. And then you can see these two children are um, significantly shorter than the, the tobacco leaves and they are five and six. Shorter children were ideal drew the short handled tools used to weed around the plants. And then families worked together drying the tobacco leaves for sale. And usually this was a task for taller children. At harvest, older children had to pull up beets and shake the soil off them, some weighing as much as 10 pounds while still caked in mud. They risked more than mud with beets leaning against their bare legs as they hacked off the tops with 16 inch knives. So this little boy is um, pulling out the beets and then um, this little boy is topping, topping the bead against his leg as he's sitting down. And topping was a finishing stroke. Um, and this family, the Reber family, worked together in the field harvesting beets. There are two adults, two children, and then there are two babies who aren't pictured. Um, and they work from May to November, and they make approximately, during that time, $350 to support their family before they move on to the next season's farm. Immigrant families made up most of the seasonal workers in the canneries too. These families were recruited in cities and transported by boat and train to the cannery camps where they stayed until the season ended. This little girl is Sadie Kelly, she's 11 years old and she picks shrimp for the Peerless Oyster Company. She picked seven pots yesterday, five pots today, Hein noted, and each pot yields about five cents. The conditions these families faced were terrible and they are frequently forced to live in squalor and filth with insects and rodent infestations and no running water. Hein was, was always concerned to find very young children often working alongside their parents no other place to be. Education was not an option in these camps. So, so on this boat, um, our parents and their children and um, boys are shucking oysters and if you are employed on the oyster boats um, for the season, and then they'll, they'll move on to the next cannery. And then in this image, we see um, in the front are a six and eight year olds, and they also work at the Peerless Oyster Company. And they have been working for a couple of years at just age six and eight. Children would stand for hours prying open oyster shells and depositing the meat into pails, which were then weighed, just like I mentioned with um, Sadie Kelly, how she would pick, you know, five pots a day and for only five cents. And then here's another oyster, Shucker, also working for Peerless Oyster Company. He's only seven years old. Then Hein had you know, done quite a bit of research and taken photographs at Ellis Island and was very familiar with tenement housing and the conditions in cities as well. Um, and so this is an example of, team, of some of the teamwork that families would do where they would all uh, work together making small textiles. So these are powder puffs and they're, they're about 40, 45 cents um, for I think gross pound. Um, and they're attempting the whole family working together and, you know, making these goods by hand. We 
these people typically lived in the garment districts where their home workshops produced easily assembled goods and provided manufacturers with a, with a more inexpensive alternative to factory workers. So a sweater would go to these different tenement houses and recruit these people um, to work from home for small amounts of money and then they wouldn't have to employ them for more money in the factories. So these families were paid one third of the factory wages for producing virtually the same goods. Working from home was often a good option for mothers with small children who in turn could assist their parents and grow the family's earnings. And then street sellers were the most vis visible child laborers, yet the abuse and adversity they endured attracted little attention. This one is borrowed from Howard Greenberg, this photograph. Um, and here we see little Freddie Kafer, who High noted was a very immature little newsie selling Saturday Evening Post and newspapers at the entrance to the state capitol. When Freddie was, when Hein asked Freddie questions, he didn't know how old he was. And another little, bo another little boy who was about eight told, told um, Hein that Freddie was about five. And you can see him sucking his thumb and holding his, his newspaper. Most observers viewed newsies as business savvy entrepreneurs, but it was quite the contrary. High noted that these children worked cruelly long hours, which began early in the morning or even in the middle or even in the middle of the night when the papers came off the press. The children paid cash for their supply, which meant that if they did not sell all their papers, they took a loss. Some children were homeless and paid for their room board and other, with their newspaper earnings, and others worked to help support their families. This is another little boy, Israel April. He stated to Hein that he served the president. He's nine years old. And Hein saw him selling after midnight um, on the 17th and 18th of April of this year. And he noted that he was quite, um, quite a uh, um, salesperson. He really chased down other um, people to sell his papers to. And he, you know, he would, had no um, fear going up to people and sell his papers. Um, so although some U.S. states during the early 20th century had laws regulating the employment of children under the age of 14, they were rarely enforced. There is no federal legislation prohibiting child labor. Meanwhile, between 1890 and 1910, as the relentless demand for cheap labor continued to grow, so did the number of working children under 15 years old. This grew from 1.5 million to 2 million children. In 1916, Congress passed a short-lived Keating-Owens Act which prohibited factories from employing children under age 14 in hazardous industries and establishing formal labor regulations. Claiming that this overstepped federal authority, the Supreme Court de declared the act unconstitutional, setting an infringement on the state's rights. Just two years before Lewis Hine died, the federal government finally regulated child labor in 1938 and the Fair Labor Standards with the Fair Labor Standards Act. This act set 14 years old as a minimum age for work outside of school hours and non-manufacturing jobs, 16 years old for employment during school hours and interstate commerce, and 18 years old for employment in hazardous occupations like mining and factory work. As part of the progressive era reform, Heinz photographs played a part in changing American legal history. His images still have an extraordinary power to stir minds and move hearts. Heinz's vision and courage to fight for children Trapped in poverty and hunger is as needed today as it was on the day his camera captured its first photograph. I wanted to end on this photograph of Hein taken by Bernice Abbott at his home in Hastings on Hudson. Abbott captured this photo when Hein was sick and financially low. Despite his path-breaking success, the public and the art world had largely forgotten Hein. He had also financed too many of his own projects which did not sell well during the depression. In 1939, Abbott managed a traveling exhibition, arranged a traveling exhibition of Hein's work with the goal of recognizing the importance of his contributions to photography and social reform. In doing so, Abbott helped cement Hein's indelible impact on the history of photography. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> I'm gonna stop my Amy. Can we stop your? Yes.
to stop my screen. Yeah, there we go. That's good. I think John Mark was was waving with question. John Mark. Hey, can Hi, you hear me? Mark. Yeah, yeah. We can. Yeah. Hi, I'm at work. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> I I um I was lucky enough to be able to see those photographs too when they first came in. And this may not be a question that you're able to answer, Amy, but because I was looking at the images in the course of the, or in the framework of the We Wear the Mask show on race and representation, I couldn't help but notice the conspicuous lack of black faces in, uh, in those photos. And, and I looked hard. Um, and I don't know if this is sort of outside the scope of what Lewis Hine was given as a job um, and his employer in, in, in particular, but um, it seems unlikely that in a, you know, beet field hiring, you know, recent Russian immigrants that um, there wouldn't be in the vicinity um, sharecroppers and uh, mm -hmm. whatnot in, in Alabama and in a lot of places that are, um, those, those photographs are located. So I don't know the answer to the question, do you? So I did a tiny, I did a little bit of research into it because I too was wondering about that. Um, and it looks like he did take some photographs in Alexandria, Virginia. And I do not remember if it was a glass blowing factory um, or if it was textile. But since unfortunately many of the factories were segregated and I think that he was his job, his task was to go and see the see where the immigrant children from Ellis Island eventually ended up going to. Um, I definitely think there's a gap in that in the research, um, and it's possible that there are other muse museums that hold, um, you know, those those photos. So something I'm actually would like to look into. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I was noting, oh, wait, you know what? Here's Suzette. We have a question from Suzette about curriculum materials available about these photos suitable for, uh, for elementary level. Uh, Suzette, I'm going to put my email address in the chat window um, because I've actually found a couple of websites that are right up your alley about what you're looking for. We did not produce any of these materials, um, but I have acts. I have some I can share with you. Uh, some really good ones, specifically some done up by a mill in uh, Maine, where. Uh, Hines spent some time photographing children working in that mill and then the mill was purchased by the town and, and they actually turned it into a historic site for a period of time with uh, sort of, a, it, it, they created quite a few uh, materials. So I, I'd be happy to share that with you if you wanna send me an email. Uh, so I see Carolyn Paulson has a hand raised. Carolyn, um, you can unmute yourself if you'd like to, uh, to ask a question. Uh, yes. Um... I wanted to make more of a comment. I gave some subscriptions to Letterjoy to a couple of my historical friends. And uh, about a month ago, they did a mailing of an original letter about Mr. Hines with all types of de de details about him. So it was quite, uh, quite amazing to me to then see my local Dorsky also <laughs> handle the same subject. So uh, just know that I guess he's he's on the minds of more than you people. So it's very cool. Actually, it makes me wonder. I, I was curious how many photographs are in roughly how many photographs are in our collection, and of the ones in the collection, are they all on view in the gallery, or are there is there a, just a selection of them? It's a selection of them, and there's like. There's quite a few, right? Is there? Do you have like an estimate as to how many there are? 
Um, I don't know if Anna remembers, probably like a, just over a hundred. Yeah, over a hundred. We wow. did use most of them, um, but there are just a few that we just couldn't fit. We couldn't fit everything in the gallery. And Zach, maybe, do you want to share how, um, if there are educators interested in these photographs, that after this exhibition is over, uh, how they can still access these images for classes or visits if they want to? Yeah, that's really good. That's a good point. Um, we do have uh, a, a large part of our collection online. Um, and I'll put that ch in the chat as well. It's HBV acc.org but i will say beyond that you can reach out to me and uh, set up time for us to pull out some objects from our collection especially if you're teaching say a photojournalism class or if you're teaching about if you're a history teacher teaching about the fair labor standards act or you know this period of photojournalism uh, uh, we can actually take images out from the collection, even if they're not on, you know, on view and put them up and, and welcome your class to see them. So that's a good point, uh, Anna, that this is something because we have such a massive resource of these, of these photographs, um, you know, it would be a really good uh, resource for local teachers. I was actually thinking on that, this idea of the the newsiness of Lewis Hine at the time, and this idea of Amy, when you were talking about you know the uh, factory owners decrying him as fake news, you know? <laughs> like it feels very I don't know, it feels very um, uh, interesting. You know, it's like it, it it feels so tied into the idea of photography in general, like. Mm -hmm. as like a bearing witness like that's something that we do now right you have I mean it's changed from maybe Lewis Hine going and photographing outside of these factories to individuals with cell phones like photographing maybe mm -hmm. uh, instances of uh, police violence or instances or maybe even like security cameras ca on people's houses capturing instances of theft I mean this idea of photography as bearing witness it's like it's something I think of as a recent phenomenon, but really is like at the core, cause what, this is what, 40 roughly, he's born 40 years roughly after the advent of photography. So uh, I see Marianne. Um, yeah, I just want to add something to that. Um, photography actually played um, a very, a significant and expanded role in ushering in the progressive period at the turn of the 20th century. And I think um, probably the most famous photographer to expose uh, living conditions and other conditions facing people, immigrants particularly, or um, people who, um, needed were living in poverty and um, all of that is Jacob Reese. So photography um, had what, I mean, I think he was actually before um, Lewis Hine. So that photography as a powerful, a powerful way to advocate for um, economic, political and social justice is well grounded and and a major, major um, influence on ushering in the entire progressive period, you know, with with uh, Teddy Roosevelt and, uh, and through Wilson, that whole period. Um, and uh, what I thought was so fascinating about uh, this exhibit is that. Um, we don't hear too much about Hein. And, and child labor is a huge issue. And the, you know, once the industrial revolution occurs in this country. And um, so I really appreciated, um, you know, what was happening at Dorsky. And, um, but a, mo a lot of people who know something about American history do know about the role of photography and they probably know about Jacob Reese. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I just wanted to, you know, mention that. And photography continues, of course, to be a very, very powerful influence on um, bringing about important um, and needed change in this country. And, um, you know, I think we all remember and the Holocaust and the, and um, what was said to, to um, what was said was bring the, bring me pictures when, when the allies opened up the concentration camps. It wasn't, they, they wanted people to see uh, as much photo, you know, as much of that and in the form of photographs as possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's really, it's a, it's a great reminder of the power of, of photography throughout its, its, its history. We have actually, we do have, I think we have about five or six Jacob Rees photographs, yeah. one which is on view, which is, I think at the Triangle Shirtwaist Fast, shirt Factory, if not the Triangle, at least a Shirtwaist Factory. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's definitely um, really, um, really, uh, you know, it, it, there's a word I'm looking for. <laughs> it resonates with this exhibition, absolutely, for sure. I'm curious, Amy, um, do we know if there are any other photographers that Veronese Abbott helped promote? Because I believe, uh, I believe that Wayne had talked about how she might have also been key in printing another early photographer's work. Not August Sander, I don't think, but um, does this is any is it kind of anybody tickling the mind their mind now? Okay. Yeah. Um, there was another photographer, I believe. I think the an early because I think that we have in our collection a really early photograph, maybe of a of a prostitute that. I believe the image, while it's an old, old negative, was printed by Berenice Abbott. I could be wrong, but I know that she did do quite a bit to help um, preserve the legacy of earlier photographers. Mm-hmm. So, um, just curious if, if there was any, if we, if you had any more information about any other people. But yeah, I'm not. I'm not too. I know that she did a lot for um, photography, but I'm not exactly sure who else she also promoted. I know that she was definitely um, like passionate about getting the idea of, you know, Lewis's Hine, Lewis Hines' contribution um, of to child, you know, to helping with child labor laws. But he also had done, you know, done those photographs of Alice, I, of um, uh, the Empire, St- Empire State Building. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, that had basically not done well and he had lost a lot of money um, in promoting those photographs, which led to him, um, you know, being in poverty during the, depre- during the depression in his later years. And I think she really wanted to, you know, help him and bring his photographs to light. Cool. Yeah. Are there any other questions for Amy Fredrickson? Um, while you think about it, you can, I'll, I'll maybe just do another quick Look tour of the exhibition. Hey, Amy, I was wondering in your research, I know we came across um, some historians who've gone in and uh, researched specific children in these photographs and researched their families and, and kind of looked into that moment in their lives and how it fits in the, the context of their the bigger journey. Were there any stories of children in these images that you particularly uh, connected to or or enjoyed or or resonated with you? I would say definitely um, Israel April. I can um, show his um, photograph again. Um, He is also on the poster for for the show. And um, I believe his name, his last name is Manning, and he has a blog where he researches um, like where the children, you know, what happened to them 
after they were no longer child laborers. And um, Israel April, April and his brothers were all newsies and they continued to sell newspapers and Israel April ended up going off to college and um, he played football. I believe he was a quarterback. You know, he got married and had a family and had a regular job after school. And he was sort of like, I guess like a success story. Um, his family knew he was a newsie. Um, they were not surprised by that at all. Um, he had told stories about it and it was definitely a big part of his identity. And then another story that um, stood to me was one of the, um, was a girl and I don't, we actually don't have her image in our collection, um, but she worked for the Peerless Oyster Company. And we do have a few um, images of um, children who did work for Peerless Oyster. And um, Manning had found her granddaughter through like ancestry records and wanted to interview her. And she knew absolutely nothing about the fact that her grandmother had been working um, in an oyster, um, you know, shucking oysters. But she did know that her grandmother had, had um, lost one of her fingers while she was shucking oysters at some point, but she didn't know she was basically a child laborer and she had never seen the photograph. So Manning showed, um, you know, this girl's granddaughter, the photographs, and she was just completely shocked, um, you know, to see her grandmother, you know, very filthy. And, you know, at that point she had, she still had, you know, her finger and it was just a big shock to the, to the family. And she also had, um, she never attended school, but she did, you know, grow up and get married and have a have a family. So lots of interesting, um, there's been a lot of research on what happened to the children after as they grew up. I think it's so funny. This was the first I had seen any of the, not funny, sorry. Wow, wrong, wrong place of words, but it was the first I had seen any of the images of the Newsies. My understanding of Newsies was fully based on that like musical that mm -hmm. there's like a Disney movie version. There's a very famous Broadway musical, um, which is actually, I think it, it's most people that are really into it are a bit younger than I am, but I know, I know that. And, and so I always just imagined these were like 16 to 19 year old, you know, loving their job, dancing in the streets. I don't know. I have never, I've never seen a movie, but it was a shock when I saw those kids with those newspapers and, and dressed in the outfits that you see like in the popular culture version of the film. It was, it, it's one of the ways that it made it real to me. I don't know, it seems strange, but because I had a, a fake version of reality and then I saw the truth of the age of the children, it really like, whoop, it was like a big twist in my mind. So that was just, I don't yeah. know, There's that's definitely an anecdotal a personal thing, but that was a, su a surprise to me. Yeah, there's definitely like a different culture, I would say like with street sellers versus like children who were working in factories and mills. Their lives are definitely very different. Um, mm -hmm. Some newsies did have to like pay for their own rent, but a lot of them were living at home with their families and making extra money. And then the newsies, you know, especially like Israel April who lived in, Washington DC, like he was selling to senators and ambassadors and, you know, walking outside the Capitol. And, you know, it was definitely like a, a different experience. And the money was going, even though they were buying their own papers, the money was going to them versus going to their families. And then they would then bring it to their families. I mean, I wonder if there's like a difference of class in terms of where these people were working or if that was specific to location. I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's sad to say, I think that, you know, from Ellis Island, there were ships bringing specific types of immigrants to these factories. So there wow. were areas where like, you know, there might be more Russian immigrants and there are Italian Im immigrants um, and then different, probably, um, you know, some of the newsies might have been American or it may not have been immigrants, they may have been born here. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of, it definitely is gonna be different um, groups of people in different classes, which is 
something a whole study in itself mm -hmm. yeah the question um uh i was just thinking you know that we saw um in so many of the photographs entire families are uh, um so that that would i think address the issue of class to some extent mm -hmm. you know that um and and um I mean that you're trying to um, expand the family um, income, and um, also it's curious too. Um, you know the issue of the role of the government at the state level mm -hmm. um, and at the federal level. This idea that unless it involved interstate, a business that was involved across state lines, the um, the Supreme Court was saying that it was not the business of the federal government. Mm -hmm. So you look to the states and what's going on in the various states, and it raises a lot of questions about mandated public education, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's another interesting component of looking at this, um, you know, in terms of, of different parts of the country and different states. And also the history of the uh, of a mandated public education and who supported it and who opposed it, because that makes a big difference about you know having such young children uh, working in these terrible conditions for anyone. I mean they were terrible working conditions for everyone and especially young children without a mandated public education. Um, so a lot of people who were involved in the union movement also were advocating for um, mandated public education at the state level and trying to influence changes there that would make a difference for, um, for children in the labor force. <laughs> Very good point. I actually came across um, a document from one of the 19, from 1916, and it was, I think, a meeting with the House of Representatives, and um, it was, just, you know, a transcript of the different, you know, state representatives speaking, and it was just so much like today, just mm -hmm. with, like, an early 20th century, you know, verbiage, but basically it was just kind of like the same states were saying, we, we you know, we don't want the gov like the federal government regulating interstate commerce and like who's going to actually go and so, and um, check on these different institutions and then some states are going to get penalized more than others and it's pretty similar to today. Mm -hmm. Wow. Any other questions, thoughts? Are you Mary Marianne? You're you must be a historian of some sort. Uh, well, I, I did, I'm a retired teacher of American history. So, Got it, from SUNY New Paltz? Uh, well, I was an adjunct there um, and uh, education, uh, teaching how, how to teach American history, basically. And, um, and I taught in the public school system, I taught, um, Advanced Placement in American History, U.S. History and Government, and uh, in the Poughkeepsie City School System. Huh. Oh, I went to Poughkeepsie <laughs> for high school. I taught at high school, and I was a labor union activist, Hello. president of the teachers union, and functioned um, in a, at the state level as well as the federal level. Great. With, with the, and Glenn, of course, is a faculty, retired faculty person, and uh, similarly, a labor activist and union person. So we we were just delighted about this show. And um, yeah. Uh, so glad. So we've got I thought, a, I thought okay. you looked familiar because I went to Poughkeepsie High School. Ah. Well, I retired many years ago, actually, and then taught at the college. Gotcha. Yeah, I graduated in 2004, so it wasn't recently. No, no, before then. <laughs> we got a couple, uh, or at least one more question from Jackie. She asks if you could expand it all on the Supreme Court decision 
was this decision made under the Oliver Wendell, Wendell Holmes court when he was um, a justice? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm, I'm not 100% I'm not sure on that. I think. Look it up. You know he was a justice. Holmes. But it was Holmes, I think. The may I all I can say is that you know the Constitution grants uh, is the source of power um, for the Congress, and um, they are specifically given power over interstate commerce. So mm -hmm. it's very difficult. It was very very difficult to regulate um, businesses that did not do uh, by the federal government. It was you know, questionable from a constitutional perspective since they were responsible for uh, businesses that cross state lines. So mm -hmm. that was, that was, that was the, 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 it was a significant substantive um, problem with the, with the constitution so that um, it, it made it difficult um, for there to be federal regulations unless the businesses were large enough so that they could, they could make a case for it being a federal focus, a federal uh, issue that could be uh, resolved with legislation, restrictive legislation. Huh. Also, Jackie, I'll say that uh, Holmes was on the Supreme Court up until 32 and the Fair Labor Act was passed in 38. So this would have been a post uh, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes. But if she means the um, the Keating Owens app, that was 1916. So then he would have been on for that. Yeah, because yeah, he was there for what 30 years, I think. It was early 1900s to 32. Cool. Well, <laughs> thank you, Amy Fredrickson. Thank you, uh, everybody else that's here. I hope that you will come and see the exhibition in person. As you can see, I think it's really beautifully hung. Uh, I think that it is um, a great show. And along with all the rest of our shows, we will have other virtual tours, which you uh, can join if you check out the programs page on the website. Uh, you can uh, sign up for any of them now. They're all free. Um, if you have any further questions about uh, the exhibition or just in general, please feel free to email uh, me. Um, I think that's it. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, John Mark. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Carolyn, Marianne, Glenn, Amy, Anna, Amy, and Harlan, who was here earlier. So. Um, have a great day, everybody. Be well. Thank you. Congratulations, Amy. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, guys. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.